Ladies and gents, we're ready to go. Thanks for waiting for us. Uh, so, um, Dr. Abed Razek is here and he's going to uh, talk to us about impaired memories, deluded practices, Britain and the Arab world. Over to you. Thank you very much. Now, we've got a picture here of good old Curzon visiting the Gulf in 1903. For those of you who don't know Curzon, he was a viceroy of India. He was the flashiest dude in the British Empire, basically. And he was a big fan of the idea of imposing a British Monroe Doctrine on the Gulf, on the Gulf region uh, of the uh, Arab world. This picture illustrates the dynamics prevailing at the time. We have Curzon sitting at the back, surrounded by his Indian guard from the Raj. And in front of him, we have all the rulers of the Gulf sheikdoms sitting on the floor, listening to the master, speaking to them and addressing them, telling them who's boss. Now, this kind of image was fairly typical of that period. And it persisted for quite a while. You continue to see images of that sort pretty much until the um, beginning of the Second World War. And I'm going to be talking about the periodization through which we can understand British-Arab relations in a second. But before that, let's take a look at a video from the present. He's having a tough time, isn't he? <laughs> but he's kind of loving it. And he's dancing with wolves. He's amongst the natives. Yeah? The situation now has changed a little bit. They're not sitting on the floor. They're sitting next to the prince. He's having a good time. He's trying to dance, trying to get funky with it. but. You know, with mixed results. What this shows, and I think we've had enough of this video for now, is that we've had a bit of a gap between that period and this period. Yeah? Obviously, a lot has changed. Curzon would not have danced the sword dance with the Gulf rulers in 1903. He was too obsessed with colonial pageantry to begin with. Yeah? He was too obsessed with the idea of having distance between the native, who has to know their place, and between the colonial ruler. Prince Charles certainly doesn't envision himself as a colonial ruler. He envisions himself as a person who is an Arabophile. He loves going to the desert. He loves hunting. He loves falconry. He hangs out with Gulf sheikhs all the time. He even manages to convince him sometimes of not changing and altering the London landscape uh, with uh, buildings that he deems offensive uh, to the built environment in the capital city. But the reality of the matter is that although much has changed, there are still some continuities. And these are some of the issues that I'm going to be talking about today. Now, before I talk about these things and the continuities that we see, um, I'm going to start by asking you to refrain from perpetuating in your minds the usual colonial conceptual attitudes that are portrayed in the present whenever anybody mentions the word colonialism. Because when we talk about colonialism in the present, we get immediately dismissed. Yeah. The first style of dismissing those talking about colonialism is stop blaming us for ills you're inflicting upon yourselves. You know, oh, it's... it's uh, Obviously, Britain now is not in the region, and 
It's the Arabs that have their malaise. Why are you complaining about us when you're obviously creating your own problems? Another colonial attitude that we listen to a lot these days and that you hear is, colonialism is a good thing. It was a good thing, and it is, and it will continue to be a good thing, so stop whining. You know, there's a lot of documentaries now talking about the virtues of empire and how wonderful of a project it was for the entirety of humankind. You know? There's a third attitude, which is colonialism was bad. We all know that. What's new? The world is a terrible place. Be real. You know, it's just the way things are. Yeah. Now, if we want to think academically about these different attitudes, we'd say that uh, the first is exemplifies latent Orientalism. The second uh, represents aggressive colonial ideology. And the third is ultimately what we would call cynicism. You know, it's not, uh, there's nothing else uh, we could uh, refer to it by no other term. But in reality, all of these combinations are manifest today whenever we talk about Britain's relationship with the Arab world. I was recently having a conversation with a, a foreign office, a, a high official in the foreign office, and who, who deals with the, with the Middle East, uh, pretty much. Um, the main line of uh, uh, argumentation was about how Britain restructured the state system in the region. And the basic thing that I was told was, you know, it's, uh, why are you complaining? You know, you are according way too much power to Britain. People in the Arab world always give way too much uh, power to us. And, you know, the, the, the reality is you're not giving enough subjectivity to the native. This is the new latest way of dismissing the charge of colonial intervention in the region. So say that basically you're being racist because you're saying that there is colonialism there. Because somehow then the natives uh, aren't uh, uh, given the agency that they uh, deserve in the picture you paint. Now, obviously, a lot of people don't believe in native agency, but they don't tend to come from circles that talk about the colonial issue because it's a very serious question. And the main reason why it's very difficult to talk about in this country and why these rhetorical strategies of dismissing it from the very beginning and nipping it in the bud, these attitudes arise because there is a problem of impaired memory in this country. There is a certain amnesia that's been imposed on this question. Yeah. We're not allowed to remember this issue, except in very, very narrow terms. It can either be uh, you know, an issue of like, yeah, let's think about it in terms of um, guilt. Or let's think about it in terms of uh, feelings of um, um, you know, wounded pride. It's either an insult to the British character if we talk about these things, or something to uh, uh, you know, feel really, really guilty about to the extent of being completely debilitated and in incapacitated and incapable of action. Actually, when we talk about colonialism, we're not interested in guilt. Certainly, I'm not interested in guilt. It's not about guilt tripping anyone. Yeah? And it's not about encouraging an attitude of complete uh, uh, you know, defeatism and, and uh, f a feeling that uh, the world has always been like this, it'll always be like this. When we talk about the persistence of an imbalance of power relations in the world that we live in today, we're actually discussing real issues that affect real people, and this is why it matters to discuss it. Now, it might help us to think about the timeline of the relationship between Britain and the Arab world so that we can understand the issues at hand. Between 1798 and 1952, we had the age of high colonialism. In the 19th century, British involvement in the affairs of the, what we now call the Arab world began in the Gulf region, which was envisioned as a buffer zone 
from which to protect India, the Indian subcontinent. And that's why Britain sent in naval fleets to that region under the pretext of combating piracy. And they controlled the entirety of the coast. In the process, they imposed a series of agreements on each one of the major tribal rulers in the area. Those agreements were called uh, perpetual uh, uh, peace agreements, treaties. Perpetual peace treaties. The main logic underlying them was that by getting the ruler to sign, Britain would ensure that, they, that the ruler would uh, refrain from dealing with any other power in the region, from attacking any of their uh, neighbors. And in the process, they would be assured that their position would be maintained as it was, as in they would remain a leader. So this is a cheap way of controlling the region. Instead of going in with big armies, you know, you, you make a treaty, and you tell the local ruler on the ground that we'll make sure that you stay in place on your throne. In return, you don't create any trouble for us in this zone that we care about. And you don't involve yourself in any foreign adventure that involves any other player. As in, you abdicate your external independence in return for control over your subjects. <coughs> and that kind of way of dealing with the region continues to some extent. And we'll talk about that in a second. For, 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 to begin with, every single ruler that had a treaty signed with them is still a ruler today. Not, you know, the same ruler, obviously, but their grandchildren, who look pretty, pretty similar. You know, there's a, let's not go into that. But uh, there's a lot of parallels between that period and the current period, certainly in the Gulf. The impact on this particular corner of the Arab world was that politics was ossified. There was very little possibility of change from within in those countries. Because every time there was any opposition to a local ruler, the British external interference ensured that they would be kept in place. Yeah. And that pattern, we saw it in multiple uprisings that took place in the region. And the last of these uprisings was one on which I wrote a book. Uh, and it ended in 1976. So it's a fairly recent uh, phenomenon. Yeah? The other part of the Arab world that was affected in the high age of colonialism was what we refer to as the Fertile Crescent, Iraq and Greater Syria. And Greater Syria includes, of course, uh, modern day uh, um, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine. These were areas that were split up intentionally as a result of the uh, Sykes-Picot uh, agreements uh, that, were, that took place during the First World War. And there was a lot of political engineering going on there. You know, the, the British and the French looked at the map, and they were like, here is our zone of influence. Here is your zone of influence. Let's decide how much you're going to get and how much we're going to get. The outcome was to divide a part of the world that had a high degree of cultural coherence, linguistic coherence, and uh, uh, ethnic coherence. And what that meant in the long run is that local identities of a sectarian nature, of a very uh, um, uh, localized nature, tended to uh, uh, predominate at various times. Yeah, instead of applying the Indian model in the Arab world, whereby British colonialism at least resulted in the creation of one unified structure, you know, of course, at, 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 at the expense of, uh, of uh, a lot of Indian lives, and of course, it, it, it led to a lot of oppression, and there was a partition. 
But at the end of the day, there were fairly large coherent structures emerging out of the process. The political impact in the Arab world was far more destructive because instead of creating some form of uh, unity out of uh, division existing, there was the creation of division out of unity. Yeah? And I don't want to exaggerate the unity too much because we, the state structure that it existed at the time was very different than our understanding of the state. But there was an imperial system. The sovereign authority was a singular one. There was an Ottoman sultan ruling over a terrain that was not divided by formalized boundaries. What we had after the British entry, the outcome was actually multiple statelets, each governed by a competing ruler. Yeah. The other, of course, part of the Arab world that was affected by Britain was Egypt. And in Egypt, we had formal occupation, direct occupation, since 1882. And it continued pretty much until the exit of the last British forces from the Suez Canal in 1956. So we're talking here about a process that went on and on and on for a very long time. From 1798 to 1952, that's a long period. And in the case of the Gulf, by the way, formal British withdrawal did not come until even 1970. So it's even longer, the trajectory. Yeah? Now, between 1952 and 1967, we have the age of independence. And two types of state emerge out of that period. There is monarchies, and these monarchies tended to come directly out of uh, political engineering uh, that was uh, done by Britain and its colonial uh, authorities. Um, every single, single monarchical regime in the region was connected to Britain somehow. In the case of the Iraqi monarchy, which was overthrown in 1958, that was a system created by Britain. In the case of the Jordanian monarchy, which persists to this very day, that was a system created by Britain. Each one of the Gulf sheikdoms, as we mentioned earlier, was basically created by uh, uh, Britain. The only exception to the rule, of course, is Saudi Arabia, which was tied to Britain by a, a, a series of alliances in its early formative period. And the Egyptian monarchy, which, uh, which, was, uh, which was, it existed before British uh, entry to the region, but became very much tied to the British presence since the occupation of Egypt in 1882. So a monarchical system was, by definition, an extension of the colonial one. The other system that was emerging in the period that we can refer to as the age of independence was a republican system. That resulted from very intense contestations with uh, the uh, British colonial authorities, in the case of the former uh, British colonies, and uh, it resulted from the uh, reproduction of um, Republican forms of uh, governance by the French uh, authorities in those colonies that were formerly ruled, ruled by France. So in the case of Egypt, the fall of the monarchy was very much connected to the uh, uh, idea of the fall of colonialism. The free officers who led the most important revolutionary event in modern Arab history, the 1952 revolution that brought uh, Nasser and the free officers to, to power, those guys were not just opposed to, the, uh, uh, to monarchy per se. Their number one priority was to overthrow colonialism was to overthrow the colonial order in the region. They didn't like the fact that Egypt was not independent and that the countries surrounding it were not independent. And that's because they were influenced by the ideas that the whole globe was influenced by during this period. We have shared values beginning to develop during this period. Those values are centered on the notion of self-determination, 
They're centered on the notion that there should be some form of national security accorded to people living on this earth. That people can't just be attacking each other. This is not a jungle. So that idea that there could be a different world system was best represented in the Bandung spirit, what we refer to as the Bandung spirit now. That was the Afro-Asian uh, conference in Bandung in 1955. And Gamal Abdel Nasser, the Egyptian president in that period, stated in a very famous speech, I do not know of any other age in which the peoples of the world have agreed on one goal as they have done now, to unite in working towards achieving a truly international system. Shall we transform this dream into a genuine reality? For a truly international system to emerge, what needed to happen was the removal of colonialism. And for colonialism to be removed, there needed to be both transformations on the ground within the former colonies and transformations within the metropolis itself. And to some extent, that process was partially successful. Certainly, within the metropolis, the popular backing for colonialism was waning during this period. We don't see now too many people who are ideologically committed to colonialism openly. There are some, and they do exist. And there is an atmosphere that allows them to express those views. But they tend to be uh, um, you know, on the fringes. Then the mainstream uh, uh, culture in this country and, 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 and to some extent in France, you can't openly be like, yeah, I believe in a world where some nations dominate other nations for the sake of it. Or I believe in a mission civilisatrice that uh, involves you know, turning these barbarians into civilized peoples. No, nowadays, you can talk about these things, but you have to couch them in a different sort of language. And of course, that happens regularly. You can couch them in the language of, we're combating terrorism, or we're asserting our values, or it's a defensive language that gets, it gets used nowadays to talk about these things. You can actually push an idea of a civilizing mission but instead of saying, I want to civilize the world, you can talk about it in defensive terms. I'm so scared of the world out there. It's a terrible place. It's a threat to me. Therefore, I must go and aggressively attack it and transform it. Yeah. Ironically, the most scared nations on Earth are nations that have nuclear weapons, huge amounts of uh, naval fleets, um, bombers. And those that live in other parts of the world, their idea of security doesn't matter. It's not relevant to them. The idea that they should oppose having foreign troops on their soil, for example, doesn't make sense. Why would they oppose that? Yeah? Can you imagine a British person being OK with their country being formally occupied by another power? You know, can you imagine being under the yoke of France or something? That would be like a terrible like, thought to anyone. Oh, yeah. Being ruled by, uh, by Paris, yeah? Or being ruled by the Germans, or being ruled by the Russians. You know, there's, there's all sorts of horror that would come with that, with, that, with, that, with that image. Even worse, being ruled by Arabs. Oh, my god. You know, all that talk of Londonistan and, and yeah, like uh, half of that Islamophobia is, is, is connected to these kind of dystopias that emerge, yeah? But the reality that other people have to live through every day in the Arab world is that of being ruled externally. Even though there's a whole structure that developed in the independence period, as I described it to you, there was a structure that was attempting to resist and to get rid of the shackles of colonialism, that experiment was not entirely successful. It was only partially successful. After all, Nasser's 
attempt to force through what he called the battle of imposing withdrawal. In Arabic, we call it Fard al Jala. That effort was not entirely successful. He succeeded to some extent in Algeria. He succeeded to some extent in pushing British forces out of Yemen. And he launched a series, he launched or supported a series of revolutions across the region. But a lot of them were defeated. A lot of them led to the rise of regimes that were too weak to be able to survive in this very difficult environment. And whenever a radical regime was born, the term radical meaning from the roots, I'm using it not in, in that kind of uh, dismissive way that gets used these days. Yeah? Radical, I'm using it in the original Greek sense, from the roots. He wanted to change things from the roots. Whenever a regime like that emerged, it was boycotted. It was subjected to harassment. It can't get loans, for example. It doesn't get foreign aid. It doesn't get access to international institutions. There's a siege mentality that's imposed on it. And in that period, in the age of the Cold War, it was easy to do that. Under the guise of, oh, these guys are going with the Soviets. But the reality of the matter is that if it wasn't for the existence of the Soviet Union, these guys would have highly, would have been very difficult for them to gain independence. It was a virtue to the bipolar system that existed in that period. Most of those people did not ideologically share the Soviet vision, but the, Soviet, uh, the existence of the Eastern Bloc meant that there was a counterbalancing power to the old colonial powers and the new imperial state that was developing in America that allowed them to some breathing space. And this was something that the Bandung spirit represented. And this was something that was lamented in London. Britain really had a difficult time in the 1950s. It was witnessing this taking place, and it didn't know what to do. In response to the Bandung conference, just before the conference started, the British cabinet had a discussion in which it declared as the conference as an unfortunate initiative that seemed likely to result in resolutions deprecating colonialism and urging prohibition of all further development of thermonuclear weapons. What a horrible vision this conference is advocating. You know, it's going to deprecate colonialism and reject the development of further development of thermonuclear weapons. That was like a terrible nightmare taking place in London during this period. These guys were on the defensive everywhere. They were on the defensive at home because people in this country were beginning to reject colonialism. They were on the defensive abroad because there was a major push in every sphere of action to try to get rid of that idea of external interference. And this is the age where we get that phenomenon, that filthy phenomenon that we know as the small colonial insurgencies, uh, the small colonial wars, the small counterinsurgencies. Call them whatever you want to call them. All of those episodes, whether we're talking about Malaya, whether we're talking about Kenya, or whether we're talking about episodes that unfolded in the Arab world of that sort, such as the war in Yemen and the war in uh, Dufar in the south of Oman, caused a huge loss of life. They divided communities. And they led to the destruction of possibilities that could have been far more democratic than the ones we ended up with. Now. <coughs> In this period, though, despite this bleak reality, there was still hope. And that hope was not totally unrealistic. People that were expressing hope were very well aware of the difficulties confronting the Arab world in this period. Perhaps the most important intellectual text to have been written then was a book by a guy called Munif al-Razzaz. And it was under the title features of the new Arab life. Munif 
said that today the Arab world is in travail, where three forces are fighting. An outpouring, emissive force stemming from the past of the first Arab Renaissance and from its modern connections to sophisticated Western or Eastern thought. A a restricting, and then there's a restricting force that pulls backwards. It is the force of the modern past, the recent past, that was represented by the old Ottoman rule. Yeah. And then there was a force that was pushing from the front to the back, putting obstacles in front of the first force, that modernizing force, and stopping its progress by spreading weakness amongst the progressive ranks. It is the force of colonialism and foreign interests. These forces fight. And despite that, the Arab world will progress. The progress is slow, torturous, confused sometimes, it's reassured that others. Now, at a hopeful note, Munif stated, this advance, however, is an unquestionable fact, and we will undoubtedly reach our goal. The difference is between reaching our goal in years or in tens or hundreds of years. So the feature of the 1950s was a belief in progress. It was possible, but the main question was, how long will it take? And by progress, these guys were talking about the emergence of a different sort of state system, essentially, that would both entail different internal relations within these states, economic and social, but also of equal importance. For our talk today, different set of external relations. It was going to have a different relationship with the former colonial powers like Britain and France. It was going to have a different set of relationships with the new emerging powers like the US. That dream effectively becomes further and further away from attainment after the 67 war. And between 67 and 1992, we have a situation where the empire was striking back. They were fighting over the Arab republics. Initially, in the 50s and 60s, they were trying to stem the tide, the revolutionary tide of transformation in the region. They were trying to stop the emergence of new independent states. They were trying to stop the fall of the monarchies that were tied to them. By the time we get to the uh, post-1967 period, they've managed to, first of all, anchor and protect the monarchies uh, that are in place. The only one that falls is the Libyan one in 69, after 67. And they manage, additionally, to ensure that the fight is taken to the uh, Republican grounds. Most of the countries that had achieved some level of independence during this period, and you know, these are not heavenly countries. These are not utopias. Yeah, a place like Iraq in the 50s and 60s, in post-58 revolution, is a place that has many challenges and many problems, yeah, internal problems. But when it comes to foreign policy, it had a certain degree of independence. It was part of that kind of push to achieve some degree of internal control over the affairs of the region. The same could be said for Egypt under Nasser. After the 1967 war, it becomes very difficult to be independent in this region. There's a resurgence of external control. But that resurgence was limited by a variety of factors. To begin with, there were strong internal social forces that were preventing it from uh, uh, spreading. But also, there was an external force in the presence of the Eastern Bloc that meant that because there there was this bipolar system, external actors couldn't just come in and invade entire regions of the world and take direct control over them. That happens after the weakening of the Soviet Union in the 1980s. We get a new regional reality developing. 
the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, which took place uh, after uh, Iraqi forces invaded Kuwait, yeah, resulted in the return of foreign troops, of large numbers of foreign troops and bases and naval fleets into the region. So we have a new reality emerging. That creates a destabilizing situation for everyone. What it does is that it upsets people to begin with. If you had external troops coming in and invading Britain, whether they were invited by the government or not is a different question. Some of these governments were inviting foreign troops. Yeah? But if these foreign troops are coming to dominate, you know, of course, like Britain sometimes has joint treaties. You know, sometimes they have an American base here, a French uh, uh, military delegation visiting there. But it doesn't compromise the sovereignty of the country. What people in the Arab world were witnessing in the post-Gulf War period was that their region was being compromised. And you had British troops there. As if colonialism never happened. As if Sykes-Picot never happened. As if something like the Balfour Declaration never happened. And this is something that I want to talk about for a second because it's a major point of contestation now. A major point, actually, that upsets people in the region as well when it comes to British-Arab relations. It's a major obstacle in the face of developing proper British-Arab relations. Britain, which has basically given away Arab lands in the form of Palestine, handed it over to the Zionist movement, which is a European settler colonial movement that believed in the principle that the Jews of Europe should be settled in the, this part of the uh, Arab world, largely on the basis of biblical prophecies and other uh, kind of ideas that were uh, present amongst Gentile Zionists during the 19th century and early 20th century. Yeah? That the creation of that problem has never been apologized for in this country. What that so-called Arab-Israeli conflict, which rages up till this very moment, is a direct result of that. And by apology, we're not asking for guilt. This is not about guilt tripping again. This is about thinking about how the past and how acknowledging the past can help us build a better future. In the post-Gulf War period, we had a major deterioration in the situation of Palestinians. We had the entry of foreign forces into the region. And that entry, if we think historically, was aggrandized and maximized after the second Gulf War. We must keep history in mind. This is the return of former colonial powers to the region. If we track the history of the region in terms of the presence of foreign troops, we begin to understand what I'm talking about. We shouldn't think of the history of the region as a series of violence and whatever. You know, the, one way they prevent us from thinking about the Middle East properly, about the Arab world properly, is it's being presented as just an inherently tumultuous zone. It'll always be violent. We'll never understand it. These people just hate each other, and ju they're just fighting. No, this is actually absolute rubbish. The reality is people are upset for real reasons. People are upset, as you would think, because there's foreign troops on their land. People are upset because there's a tragedy unfolding in Palestine. And when David Cameron goes a couple of weeks ago and starts praising how great the state of Israel is at a time when it's bombing Gaza, yeah, and at a time when he's disparaging any Palestinian attempt to counter Israel even in the most peaceful means through, for example, talking about the need to stop funding Israel on, uh, uh, to the degree that it's being done today. 
You know, there's a basic demand that comes from the Arab world. Like, stop funding Israel. You know, people aren't even asking of like, the, the, the Britain to, uh, not, uh, to interfere directly in the uh, situation there. They're asking Britain to stop funding. What's the response of Cameron to that? He's saying, I will always stand up for the right of Israel to defend the citizens, right, enshrined in international law. Of course, he doesn't stand up for the, that right for the Palestinians. We don't hear him talking about that. In natural justice and fundamental morality, and in decades of common endeavor between Israel and their allies, Britain is seen and is presented here as one of the allies of Israel. Why? We don't know. Why would you want to alienate 400 million people in the Arab world and 1.2 billion people in the Muslim world to be an ally of a 5 million person settler colonial state? It's kind of like what they were doing in South Africa. For the sake of settler colonialists in, uh, uh, in South Africa, they were willing to bring the hostility of the entire tricontinental world. But obviously, now that Mandela, when Mandela dies, Cameron was like, oh yeah, he was a great hero. And he was trying to detach himself from conservative, conservative policy under Thatcher. He's doing now the same thing in Palestine. And it's dangerous. I'm going to wrap up. Because we could go on and on and on in this sort of talk. And I'm going to wrap up by talking about what are the possibilities for a better relationship. And I think the first possibility, the first point on which we must work together is that of acknowledging the past. Not for the purposes of blame, but for the purposes of respect. Yeah? Balfour was bad. Saying that is not that hard. Balfour sucked. Yeah? What's so hard about saying that? You know, it doesn't mean that people in the current age are responsible for it or anything. No, it meant that there was a British administration once upon a time that did a terrible thing that people are still suffering as a result of. Sykes-Picot was bad. That's not a very hard statement to make. You know. What's so difficult about that? It'll make a lot of people happy when they hear it. Why? Not because they're just dwelling on the past, but it'll reassure them that there's a different type of policy in the present, that there's a change of direction. Right? A second area that's important that arises out of this, once we stop ignoring the past, erasing the past, and using rhetorical strategies to stop people from talking about the past by telling them, oh, you're just a blamer, or you're just a hater, or you, st uh, you know, stop dwelling on colonialism, or colonialism was a great thing, which is the most offensive you know, thing that people do these days. Yeah. The second thing that comes out of this that really, really is important once we've done this acknowledgment and once we've stopped indulging in these rhetorical <laughs> strategies, we can start thinking about what would a better relationship between Britain and the Arab world entail. And I, I would suggest there's three major precepts. Number one, Britain should stop being the junior partner to America and its adventures in the region. That's not a fruitful path for this country. It's not a good path for this country, and it's not most importantly, it's not a good path for the people of the region. Britain's role in the Iraq war was terrible. The destruction of the Iraqi state did not benefit anyone. The human toll did not benefit anyone. And the destabilization of the region for decades to come that emerged out of the Iraq war did not benefit anyone. And perhaps if Britain did not join the American adventure there, we would not have seen the Iraq war happen. Now, we still haven't heard an apology from those who started the war or from the opposition that went along with the war. I think we need that kind of apology. Second, second thing, and that's connected to not being actually just a junior partner in relationship with America, is Britain has to constructively reconstruct the way it talks about the region. 
besides ceasing to do bad acts by being the junior partner to America, it has to talk in a different way. That patronizing talk, that colonial language, that refusal to restructure the way we view that part of the world is an obstacle to the development of good human relations. Speeches like those made by Cameron and the Knesset are not good. They make people upset. They're insensitive. And they're not necessary. It doesn't bring any benefit to Britain. It doesn't bring any benefit to the people of the region. In fact, it's pretty harmful. So there needs to be a different sort of language adopted. But language is not enough. There needs to be a different sort of action. The main problem in all the periods that I have described was that there was external opposition to the creation of a functional, independent, regional system in this part of the world. The Western powers have not been, have not come to terms with the idea that the only way this part of the world could be stabilized is for it to be independent. The only force that could have stabilized it in the 1950s, actually, was Nasser. Nasserism, for example. You needed a strong, centralized order within the region that was independent enough from external control and that was capable to organize its energies and to organize its resources and to restructure them in a fairer way internally. Yeah, that kind of force would have been very beneficial for the uh, development of the region. But instead, which would have been beneficial for the rest of the world as well. Because in the long run, it's not good to have a constant open question. The big open question of the 19th century was the Eastern question. What was going to happen to the former Ottoman Empire, to what was called the sick man of Europe? The big question <coughs> of the 21st century is the Arab question. How it will be resolved is a matter that will depend on the factors I've just outlined. Thank you very much.